everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. Today on the show, we have an interesting guest. His name is Court Wing. Court is a participant in the NYU psilocybin study for major depressive disorder. Court has a super interesting athletic background and physiology background and has a lot to say. So this is kind of his personal story interjected with some pretty cool commentary and interesting thoughts around how to handle or how to think about certain, yeah, (laughs) how does pain work in the body? How does um, proprioception work? All all sorts of really interesting things, like even some links into Stan Groff's COEX systems. And uh, there's some great stuff here and I, I hope you enjoy it. I had a really wonderful time talking to Court and I do plan to have him on again. It was such a fun conversation. We talked to for at least another half an hour after the interview wrapped. So this is a little bit of a long one. I hope you enjoy it and we'll see you on the other side. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics. Today, I'm here with Court Wing, a recent participant in one of the NYU psilocybin trials. Thanks for joining us, Court. Thanks for having me here today. Glad to be with you guys. Absolutely. Um, Really appreciate you reaching out. No, not at all. So what was the the name of the study or do you know what they were looking at in this particular study? So it was a study for a major depressive disorder. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I think to a degree it was for treatment resistant major depressive disorder. I certainly uh, qualified to a not insignificant degree for, for that portion. Mm-hmm. Great. Great. So it's it's a pretty substantial program, right? There's some kind of pre-session work, session work, and then post-session work. Yes. So um, surprisingly involved, um, and and mm-hmm. I went in kind of naive, uh, which I think is is helpful because it, I wasn't intimidated to reach out then. So there was uh, an initial online screening. And then there was a a phone screening followed by probably about two or three more phone screenings. And once I got Mm. past those initial screens, then it was the in-person screening. And there was about three of those initially. And then once I got past uh, those uh, three initial in-screen ones, I believe there were around, boy, maybe another three to five screenings. So psychological assessments psychological um, uh, qualifications, going into diagnostic history, as well as all the physiology, because they wanted you had to fit within a certain range in terms of blood pressure, heart rate, stuff like that. Was that a little alarming to have to do all that testing or did it feel make you feel safer? It, it was, it made me feel safer, you know, and it was reassuring. And as, as someone who's not unfamiliar with the, um, health and fitness field, I, I, I understood that whereas I personally may have been receiving the benefit of the, the treatment, that it was an ongoing uh, scientific study for the efficacy mm-hmm. of you know, uh, psilocybin in, in, in dealing with this condition. And so I really wanted to support that work. And so I, I was thorough and rigorous in disclosing yeah. everything that I could with them. And, but it was very reassuring to see how careful they were with all of this. It's a big deal, right? Like yeah. you're, you're essentially, <laughs> there, there's a good analogy here with like open heart surgery or any <laughs> kind of surgery, really. It's like, how do you uh, trust that person to really work with you at this level? And the yeah, care, any thoughts there? Yeah. <laughs> I, um, the care and consideration that a they put into each moment of interaction, you could just see that these people were passionate about what they were doing. They were trying to be as scrupulous as possible. And yet the sensitivity uh, that they had for me as a person with depression coming in and going through this, you know, somewhat odd circumstance. Oh yeah. You know, they're, they're lovely, caring people. Um, and also extremely professional. You could see how, 
how much time they had put into vetting the whole process. And also that that was always in the back of their mind that they were following protocols. So there would be some encounters where they'd say, I'm sorry, but we can't do that because that would be a violation of protocol or, or that. And then the joke became, oh, okay, I know, I don't want to mess up your data sets. <laughs> you know, so there's, there's a lot there where it's just like, ah, oh, wait, you know, and so I started to anticipate some of that after a certain point, mm-hmm. in spite of also dealing with the depression at the same time. So yeah, they, for me, it was deeply reassuring. That's really good. Yeah, it's from some of the researchers' perspectives, I've heard some pretty tough stories because they get these phone, highly emotional phone calls where people get screened out <laughs> uh-huh. or like they only get the placebo and they're just so desperate for help, you know? And it's like heartbreaking for a lot of researchers out there so to, to not be able to break protocol. I, I, I believe at some... so. At, at some point, they didn't disclose anything to me, but they had intimated mm-hmm. through a series of questions. They're like, you do realize you could end up on the placebo here and, and we're not promising anything. And, you know, th- this is an investigational study yeah. and everything. And it's like, and, and so I actually went into a process of sort of, as I just outlined to you, reassuring to them <laughs> that I understood <laughs> that this was an investigational study, but I, I, yeah. I was feeling some tremulous hope because I had read a, uh, an overview of uh, various psychedelics and their effects on the, the prefrontal cortex specifically. And, mm-hmm. and I had completely lost track of uh, at that point that, you know, we do see um, dendritic atrophy in people with depression and it had taken me, yes, I would say a long time to fully acknowledge, recognize, admit that that's what was going on with me. Um, I I think a lot of what was happening. So, so going to phone calls and stuff, like I had to do multiple, multiple long phone calls with what's called a central raider. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know how much of this I'm, I, I can disclose, you know, cause I, I don't want to skew anyone's expectations that may go into this, but the, the questions were probing and nuanced. And one question I would rate myself, you know, if it was something that involved a rating on one to 10, how, how much do you feel with feel this or agree with this as a statement about yourself? You know, one question would hit me and I go, ah, oh, four. And then another question, like say five questions later, it would be a subtle word change. And uh-huh. I would suddenly be verklempt, you know, or crying or extremely reactive because the question suddenly made me have to recognize an aspect mm. of myself that I, I was probably deeply masking, <laughs> not just to right. society or work but to myself. Mm-hmm. So I, uh, I, I'm sure that is a burden they, they carry most days. And at the same time, I think the promise of what is happening probably inspires and drives them quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> and you, it has to, right? Yeah. They, they all have that light in their eyes and you know, they're scientists, but I'd, I'd also say just they're, they're probably true believers at this point based on what they've seen, you know, with the uh, end of life anxiety yeah. research alone. I mean, that, that has to be gratifying. Uh, and I was yeah. only number three <laughs> uh, coming, <laughs> through, coming through this one. And then the entire program shut down because of the lockdown. I think, uh, right. I think countrywide, and from what I was given to understand, I was the last person to pass through before the lockdown happened, mm. like anywhere in the oh. states. So, I mean, I was kind of a rare bird going in. Uh, I think, based on my history and and profile, and I, I think I became an even rarer bird <laughs> on the way out. So. Yeah, it's um, 
it's tough that everybody got really excited like throughout the course of 2019 and then all 2020 has been really exciting. And then uh, lockdown and everywhere and everyone. Yeah. From what I understand, there are sessions starting back up at NYU. That's what I've been given to understand as well. I'm a like one, one thought I have is that the research is happening inside a hospital, right? So you have to like, take this kind of scary step in uh, today's COVID age to go into a hospital. Well, <laughs> like that, that's a little creepy to me, but I, I still trust that the outcome would be good. So largely. So right. I'm, I'm here in, in NYC, right? My, my wife is an essential healthcare worker. So she was mm-hmm. very close to what was going on here in many ways. Not not directly in the ER, though I do have friends that were ICU managers and saw this up close mm-hmm. and personal. As I was getting ready to go into my session day, you know, I'd been introduced to the to the session room. And honestly, it was hard not to feel, and I'm sorry for the emotion here, it was hard not to feel gratitude for the way they set the place up. It was almost mm-hmm. exactly what I envisioned and hoped for in going into this study because I was not unaware of the research that was going on and had been going on for decades. I myself personally am not psychedelically naive, but it had been nearly a quarter of a century. And in the mm-hmm. intervening time, I've been a member of a 12-step program for a severe alcohol disuse issue. Uh, Mm -hmm. So 17 years sober, but the the depression was such and had been unresponsive to sticking my toe back into the water in terms of um, psychiatric drugs for treating depression that had previously worked Mm -hmm. and did not work this time. So going into that hospital setting, going into a, a... carefully laid out room um, that was nurturing and soothing, uh, yet it also being within a uh, hospital setting, it's just a double layer of reassurance, uh, at Mm -hmm. least for me in that moment. Now, I know within probably the larger psychedelic community, there's a lot of concern, I'm guessing, or I'm reading. (laughs) about the medicalization aspect. And it's like, you know, okay, now all these people that have been kind of quietly beavering away for decades, kind of establishing this beachhead. And then now there's this idea like this is going to strictly go into mainstream medicine and like all you guys, thanks so much. Bye-bye. I could imagine there's some uh, friction, (laughs) shall we say? Right. Like will psychiatry dominate? Exactly. I think the cat's too far out of the bag mm. for that to really happen. Good. But, you know, I, I'm hopeful for religious use cases. I, I, um, I think that's really likely. I, I mean, I, I, you know, you, I just don't see how that's possible. And particularly when you can easily establish that culturally that's been going on as a sacrament, you know, at least in Central and South America for no small mm-hmm. stretch of time. and probably longer than we imagine. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, like it, it does feel... I'm not sure. Did I answer the question there? Uh, I, I know I tend to <laughs> just interject if I start veering here. No worries. No worries at all. Yeah, no real question. It's just that there's... Um, this is a big topic that's been coming up a lot. Uh, are psychedelics only going to be for psychiatrists or is it still okay to go to a Grateful Dead show? But like, why, why is it the case that they're mutually exclusive? Is it necessarily the case that it has to only be medical? I don't think so. I, I would think a lot of doctors would largely agree, but some would fervently disagree. I'm, I'm, you know? I'm, I'm more than well aware of the people that fervently disagree. Certainly within the investment <laughs> space, you, you, a lot of those folks mm-hmm. kind of speak out. And I mean, trying to protect their IP or whatever. Um, I, and I'm not saying that dismissively, um, but but it's at odds with the real world experience of people that have been bringing this evidence forth through their own 
self-experimentation. And obviously yeah. there are therapists that have been out there, you know, in other countries and obviously here that had their initial brush with these things and saw the benefit. And they, they developed yeah. these protocols. And I think that was largely followed within this study because I, I had two facilitators. Both were psychiatrists that um, had uh, strong clinical backgrounds. Uh, I believe each had had training with either MAPS or USONA Institute. I'm not sure which specifically mm -hmm. for this type of therapy. And so the the skill and the delicacy and the compassion that they evinced within that session and both before and after it truly such a gift um but i know this has been happening outside of medical context as well we 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 all know of people that have not fared well <laughs> in a in a casual setting sometimes and and I think that's in large part due to a lack of information and education that's out there. So I think a lot of what you guys are doing and other organizations like yourself, the harm reduction method, I think, is is crucial because the instances where things uh, have not been easy for people or have been you know, what they call challenging or difficult experiences. A lot of that was happening under uncontrolled conditions or by people that totally. were naive or misguided. And as we, as we all know by now, set and setting, it's just so crucial. The expectations you go in with and um, the experiences and the present conditions you're bringing to a very potentially powerful substance like this, um, you know, they shouldn't be trifled with. But I, I don't want to negate uh, or diminish people who use this beyond a, a medical setting. But for me, what has been so striking is because prior to, the, prior to this occurring for me, you know, 25 years ago, I did it in an exploratory quality, you know, just past my 25th birthday with a what I was told later was a fairly large dose of LSD, but it was done within that set and setting context. And, you know, as Roland Griffiths research showed, you know, it was, it was life changing. It was one of those things yeah. I can remember to this day. But going back into it now, and like I said, in kind of a Robinson Crusoe like way almost, you know, in intentionality makes a striking difference. And I was suffering from the depression. It had become intractable. And I really didn't want to hope going in. I was both worried about mm -hmm. receiving the placebo. I was also worried like, what if this just doesn't work? Or what if it only sort of works? You know? Right. At one point, the study head, uh, we were we were nearing the the dosing day, um, and you know we were kind of going through the what ifs. What if it is a placebo? What you know? There there are other options out there, and we will be sure. That was another thing they reassured me: if this does not work for you, we are not going to just drop you off the boat and say bye bye. Good luck on the dog paddling. But I said, well, something like let's see, but it brought up a lot of emotion for me. And he goes, what's going on there? Because I was getting choked up. And I just said, I'm trying not to hope. You know, and mm. the outcome has been just so far beyond what I expected in terms of the resolution. Apparently, some of my, uh, if I'm pronouncing this correctly, Madrasa scores uh, I don't know the measures too well. Yeah, I, I know, right. but apparently some of them dropped from 40 to zero. And then wow. I can just say clearly the feeling space is completely different. There are thoughts and viewpoints that are absent now that used to be present, brief and fleeting daily that were very mm -hmm. distressing. 
I was able to control those thoughts. But at the same time, and like I say, brief, when I say brief and fleeting, I mean, you know, distressing thoughts of about five to 10 seconds in length that would appear and then, then they'd subsume. So I, I've recognized there are other people out there suffering with depression where it's more severe uh, than that. Mm. And my heart goes out to them. But it was very distressing to me. And it would leave um, an emotional hangover for hours, just the fact that they had appeared, you know? Right. So, and, and, I've, and I've, I've seen some of your email, some of the, your post about the emails you receive, where people are talking about things such as suicidal ideation and the, yeah. the battle. I, I, I just, I want to recognize you just for being willing. Yeah, thank you, Cord. It's really like I've I've done face to face work with a lot of people, and for whatever reason, that doesn't feel as challenging, right? <laughs> it's like this remote, <laughs> like no, okay, yeah, I, I, you've had like the most horrific things, but I can still talk to you in person. But yeah. like emails, it's like ah, oh no, I have no control here. That's it's exactly scary. right. Yeah, your your ability. So much happens in person on an assessment level. So this happened, this has happened mm. for me, you know, people come to me over the years, um, for, for chronic pain and PTSD and, and those things are, are, are certainly often present with, uh, people that have had, um, wartime injuries and I've had mm -hmm. other people where they have not come to me necessarily specifically for, uh, PTSD or something akin to that for sexual trauma. But sometimes in resolving another issue that they've got going on, that will suddenly emerge. And, you know, these things are not occurring in isolation to each other. Uh, and I, I, I don't think um, depression, and, and I, I think I've, there's strong evidence out there based on this study, uh, as well as what we've known over the last, say, roughly half a century that... Um, I think there's a strong case to be made that um, depression and, and other similar mental health issues may be more of a nociceptive event than, than we've really given it credit for. And so how do you mean that nociceptive? So, so nociceptive is noxious stimulus within the nervous system, right? So around your body, uh, you know, people are roughly aware of what proprioception is. It's kind of your body's ongoing right. 3D map to have a sense of where it is in space, how it's moving, limb position, speed, feeling, and things like that. And around the joint beds, you have the highest density of nerve endings, uh, just because that's where most of the motion occurs. But within mm. within a pain framework, you you, you could roughly generalize generalize to um, you have mechanoceptors and you have nociceptors. Mm. Information coming from mechanoceptors is where mechanical information, as the name implies, those are big, fat, fast nerve impulses that are of very high survival significance, right? Um, mm -hmm. Nociception, that's noxious stimuli. Those are small, slow, and weak. But at a certain point, there's a, what's, the previous theory was called pain gating that would tip over mm -hmm. and then you have a nociceptive event and then it becomes cognitively the most uh, unignorable, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, and chronic pain is when you have over chunking of that nociceptive pathway that then becomes, um, you start running into things like cortical smearing one area of the brain starts bleeding that information into another part of the brain. And so, mm. it, and, and then it's like, it just doesn't go away. And now not only does that affected limb or area of the body feel pain, it feels pain more, right? So if you look mm. at depression, it can also be seen, or anxiety, it also could be seen as a nociceptive event because what you have is a pathway of iterative rumination that just continues mm -hmm. and continues and your framework really becomes very constrained. Everything that comes in only reinforces that depressive framework. Uh, and, and the things that reinforce it get magnified. The things that don't just 
there is not enough present inhibition to suppress the rumination. So the, the stuff that could be calming it down just doesn't. Does, is, is that clear? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and so as I was going through the study, I read this, you know, I, I read a lot online and then I came across this one study about depression and it was a, uh, it was a study review of multiple studies <clears throat> where they talked about all the um, atrophy that happens in the prefrontal cortex uh, for people suffering from depression. And I had totally lost track of that. Uh, and then I saw that, you know, various uh, psychedelic drugs or compounds, you know, I think it was specifically reviewing LSD, psilocybin, and I believe DMT, uh, don't quote me, mm. maybe it was MDMA, where they talked about the increase in dendritic arborization, the, din- the increase in neurotogenesis, synaptogenesis, and that the, there was a um, profound change in neuroplasticity. That's the key to the kingdom when it comes to what's happening over in the chronic pain world. So when I realized perhaps that could happen for me with my depression, it was a very bright spot in, in seeing if I was going to qualify for this or not. Perhaps there's a very roundabout mm. answer there, but I'm, I'm just trying to be thorough here. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So getting really deep into this, it <laughs> reminds me that we didn't really flesh out your background sure. much. So yeah, let's start <laughs> a little bit. So you've got a lot of experience as a trainer, but also in some really specific modalities. Can you talk about that? Sure. So I'll just... I was in a performing arts high school in back in Seattle, Washington. Uh, I got into... It was one of the top performing arts high schools in the country. I got into an advanced drama program there, got out of high school, and then uh, started practicing Aikido mm. nearby. And it was, you know, first it was two hours a couple times a week. Then it became three hours, multiple days a week. Then that turned into four or five hours a day almost daily. And then the chief instructor of the United States moved back to Seattle. And eventually I became what's called an Uchi Deshi, which is a live and apprentice. Uh, my style uh, was called Kiai Kido. Um, and it's specifically focused on mind and body coordination. So a, there's a heavy emphasis mm. on um, meditation, what I would now uh, term uh, training that would specifically enhance both proprioception and interoception. Uh, back mm-hmm. then it was like, quote unquote, key exercises, developing your key. And, uh, I became an international gold medal winner in that, which is weird since like, you know, it's non-competitive, but, uh, like I, I <laughs> this, this was something comparable to like, um, a fixed gymnastic or uh, figure skating set done with a partner. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, my partner and I, uh, we won uh, Scott Bohart. We won the uh, international Taigi competition in the international competitors division in uh, the summer of 2000. Then I went back to acting school. Uh, after like a 12-year hiatus, I ended up at SUNY Purchase uh, Conservatory for Theater and Film Arts. Mm-hmm. That was one of the top conservatories then to get into one of the top five, I think now still in that category. But they wanted me, I, and I'm not putting down yoga, <laughs> but we had to start doing like two and a half hours of yoga every other day. And mm. I had just... It's a lot. It's, it's a lot. And um, at, at a certain point, I tweaked my knee and I'm like, you know, I'm, I think I've really expended my range here when it comes to the perhaps Asian associative approach. What's going on scientifically? <laughs> That led me to looking for a book on scientific stretching, but I ended up uh, getting a book by Pavel Satsulin, uh, who at the time uh, was a former Spetsnaz trainer. That was a Russian special forces guy. And he had reintroduced kettlebells to the United States. I got into his stretching book, then I got into kettlebells. And uh, that was in 2002. Then in 2003, I was going home on a break. I said I should get trained in this specifically by someone who's certified to do this. So I ended up at CrossFit North, which was the very first affiliate outside of HQ in the United States. And my uh, coaches there were uh, Dave Warner and Nick Nibbler. 
and they encouraged me to try CrossFit and I wasn't interested. Was in I wanted Seattle? to just, this is in Seattle. And I only wanted to do kettlebells. So I'm like, ah, CrossFit's not for me. So they tricked me and made me do a kettlebell workout, which was a CrossFit workout. And that was that. Uh, I was hooked. And so they encouraged me to go help start CrossFit in New York. And I helped co-found mm. the first CrossFit gym there. I've since left that affiliate. Uh, so I no longer own a stake in that. That was in 2018. But this was back in 2004. And so started teaching and coaching in that uh, as mm -hmm. well as in kettlebells. And then uh, as I was going through my kettlebell certifications, I became aware of a mobility certification called Z Health. Uh, but mobility mm. was just a, a window or approach for gaining access to the nervous system. Um, and so it's much more of a brain-based approach to neurophysiology in dealing with both uh, yeah. pain and performance. So, so those have been my my three gigs there. And in addition to that, uh, I have an older son. I have two, two younger sons uh, with my wife, but I also have an older son uh, from a previous relationship. He has profound autism. And so as that was occurring to me in the 90s, I had to go into like a lot of parents into what was going on in the, in the literature, the scientific literature to try to find a solution. And at a certain point, uh, I was also working at Amazon and uh, dealing with concentration issues. And then I became aware of ADD through the volume of books coming across my desktop. And as soon as I read those descriptions, that recontextualized my life right there. So, mm. so I, I, all, all of that has been present. And, and I was the first, I was the first, uh, certified CrossFit trainer in New York that owned a gym. And then, you know, all my fellow trainers got their certifications eh, like within months of that as well. Mm. Uh, I was the first certified Z health trainer in New York, the first certified master trainer in New York. I've, I've worked with astronauts. I've worked with presidents, uh, president of Estonia, Thomas uh, Hendricks Ills, um, you know, Garrett Reisman, who is a significant astronaut on uh, briefly, uh, when he visited my gym, sorry. I also um, had a very good friend, and this leads into this story here of why I ended up at NYU. I had a very good friend, Kirk McLeod, who is the head security advisor uh, to the UN. And he asked me to develop the UN's uh, close protection securities fitness and assessment platform. Uh, and mm. I, I worked in, uh, so I worked with uh, Trent O'Brien, who was in charge of that. So it's, it's like diplomatic security, getting everybody around mm -hmm. the world fit and ready to protect diplomats. And so, uh, you, you know, when I, when I went into the, um, into the session room, I wasn't, I wasn't unaware of what was going to be happening neurologically, but it, I, it was very different from what had happened nearly 25 years earlier, because then I was, mm -hmm completely <laughs> uninitiated and unaware of all this stuff. Uh, I, I didn't have that educational background in, in neurophysiology uh, or, or just regular right. fitness. So I, I, I can see going in now the, the difference that intention makes uh, in what you're seeking from the session. It's just astonishing that it, it's, it's responsive to intent. It's hard to put out there. <laughs> what it, it's it's so mind blowing, you know, be, because it's it's you're not just taking this passively. Mm -hmm. You know, like what is it about human intention that makes it so magical? Yes. There's something there that needs to be in, investigated it, for sure. I I think I I don't want to say it's the whole investigation, but it's more than fifty percent. You know, you don't right. take SSRIs with intention, I don't think. I'm not trying to negate or diminish the life-saving quality that those have had. Certainly not in the same way. Not in the same yeah. way. It's like, you take it and let's see if it works. And you can you could claim that's the case here with psilocybin, but go, I mean, all the research, all the evidence shows, you go into that session as I did with like, what are your intentions for this session? 
what do you want to see have happen? Mm -hmm. And that seems to make a significant contribution to the outcome, provided you have a a well formatted, should we put it that way? <laughs> well formatted sure. set yeah. and setting um, with with adequate support or or at the very least good experience, like under your belt, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so, so to not exclusively put this within only a medicalized context, cause I realized, you know, listening to you guys, there's a lot out there. Um, <laughs> there's an awful lot out there. Um, and I, I realized I've, 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 so, so that's, that's a big part of my background. Um, meaning it's, there's not just like one frame of how to approach this work. I don't think so. Being a lot of, I don't yeah, think so. No, there's but so I, many frames. I, I think. Honestly, though, for people coming in uh, with mental health issues, I, I think the the current medicalized format that's being explored, from my experience, seems to be the way to go. I, I agree. Like one to two therapists, a lot of prep, a lot of post care, yeah. and you can you can do a lot in one to two sessions. You you can. Like, and and you had one med session. Um, one single one single med session. And yeah, it, it seems like, you know, N of one here, but we've got, you know, decades <laughs> of history of this stuff. Yeah. N of one, but you're, you seem to be doing really well relative to where you were before. It's, it's hard to overstate the difference. And I think that's mm -hmm. also something, and, and I emphasize this to Dr. Ross. Yeah. I think a feature that needs to be, strongly promoted of the psychedelic medicine approach to this type of issue. And in, in my case, the treatment resistant um, depression is the rapid onset and the, the stark contrast that provides. Because right. as I mentioned earlier, when I was going through the assessment process and they're, they're doing the screening for, all the psychological issues and everything. It, it was a confrontation in many ways with a depression that I didn't want to mm -hmm. admit existed. And, and I had gotten back into a psychiatric approach not quite a year earlier to that. And I had given it a go and took medications that had previously worked for me 20 years earlier. And this time there was nothing. And that was mm. alarming. <laughs> You know, mm. and I increased the dose and still nothing, zero change. And I didn't want to get too far down the SSRI rabbit hole because there's a very long taper there. And I was starting yeah. to hear from podcast everything that was going on and, and then became aware that there were studies available. So I tapered off when nothing had changed. But the, the contrast from before to after made mm. me want to go back and upgrade my scores in those depression assessments because I had no idea how bad it was till it was gone. Right. And and it's it was in less than eight hours. Ugh. You know, I I, yeah. I I walked in there at 8 a.m. They did their their pre um session assessments. They gave me a choice of what chalice to choose. Mm. And I couldn't help but flash back on Indiana Jones. Of, <laughs> he chose poorly. The one. And so there was a fancy <laughs> metal one. And then there was like a hand cast yeah. uh, ceramic one, which sort of looked like some of the Raku lacquerware from Japan. And so I mm -hmm. chose that one. And we did a little intention setting ceremony. And I did a little... Shinto type of prayer thing, um, incantation that I've always done since I left Aikido. And I, mm. they gave it to me and put it in this chalice and I looked down at it and, you know, honestly, I was, I was praying to God or my higher power or the universe, however you want to phrase it. And I, and I looked at it and I said, I yeah. really hope that's you. Mm. Yeah. And it oh, was that's magical, it, you know, yeah. within half an hour. It, oh. within a half an hour, it kicked in. And I remember looking at them like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, and then, <sighs> then, and then I started doing like little self assessments. You know, I was kind of doing a screen on my upper and lower body, checking what extensor flexor mm -hmm. tone was like, 
where sensation was happening. Was it going through my viscera first? And then like, you know, they have a lovely painting there and it started breathing. And so then I started timing to see, you know, watching it, seeing, is this timing with my rep- respiration? No. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, little fractal clouds started bubbling out of the painting. And it's like, you know, I just remember kind of languidly turning towards them. And I said, I don't think I'm randomized, you know. <laughs> 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 and the, the shocking thing was the volume of psychological content that came out. Mm-hmm. You know, all all the classic psychedelic tropes were present. Like at one point, like the whole world was nothing but a fractal pattern of what seemed to be entities from Central America offering forth little dosing bowls saying, take the medicine. Mm. And then it transformed into what would the 21st century look like if Mayan culture had continued you know, Mm -hmm. in a sort of a um, William Gibson sort of way. Sure. Not to date myself there, but... (laughs) (laughs) Like Neuromancer? Oh, yeah. Um, Yeah. But the childhood stuff that came up was undeniable. And um, I think I briefly had mentioned earlier, you know, I've been in recovery um, from a profound drinking problem Uh, for over 17 years. And so there'd been significant hesitation on my part to do this because there's, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of cautioning within that framework. You know, there's no such thing as a chemical solution to a spiritual problem. But what do you do when the chemical chemistry brings you a spiritual experience? And, And I'd had my previous experienced when I was 21 and pre-alcoholic to refer back to. Mm -hmm. And I'd had spiritual experiences completely sober to refer to as well. I I had a mountaintop experience that got me sober completely Mm -hmm. outside of any chemistry, but in no way did that negate the very real things that were happening, that had happened to me when I was 21 on LSD and that were now happening to me on that couch within Bellevue hospital with two incredibly skilled and loving people. And at 19, I fall, I fell in love with a woman, first woman I fell in love with. um, And then that broke up five months later and I got pretty messed up over that. We got together again a year later, but it just got worse. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. And I did not deal well with grief. I, I became a profoundly sloppy drunk. No one knew what to do with me, honestly. And the grief never went away because uh, two and a half years after we broke up, she killed herself. Mm. And I, I, I just, I was, you know, pretty much inconsolable. And, and I had dealt with it for years within the recovery context and within therapeutic contexts. Um, and, and even through ritual poetic drama from the African continuum, which was a, a something I was taught by Dr. Tanya Pettiford Waits, who is a very big deal um, drama teacher to me, who was the one who pushed me to reapply to get in back into, um, into an acting conservatory. She saw in me what I, I definitely couldn't see in myself, but all of that stuff had been mitigated, but never fully resolved. And on that couch, it just, it all came out. It, it, mm. it all came out and it just does not have the same bite in any way whatsoever that it did before. And the, the intrusive thoughts that were occurring mostly around my, um, uh, the loss of my gym and um, yeah. my friend who was the head a security advisor, he died of cancer in 2014 and I had mm. done everything I could to help him. At the same time, I had a ex-business partner who we discovered was committing a Ponzi scheme. Uh, oh. Yeah. Um, oh. And, you know, eventually he was convicted and went off to prison. But it left me in and my wife in economic devastation. And that compounded everything. Uh, and, and, and so, 
you know, the, the, the depression, uh, like really had its teeth in me, uh, yeah. really had its teeth in me. And so I was having these intrusive thoughts as a result daily. And <clears throat> after this, they've been gone. Like the, the, the resilience of this is shocking. I, I had had, I had all these plans. <laughs> oh, I'm going to go do this and mm-hmm. do this after all this. And it was like 10 days later, lockdown. And then I've been essentially in the house with my two young boys for the last four months, mm. you know, while the death toll has only been climbing yeah. in the very immediate neighborhood surrounding us. And I, I'm not claiming any type of uh, sainthood here or that, I don't uh, annoy my wife ever. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, she's a saint in uh, her own very real way and has over the years through all this provided an uh, indescribable amount of uh, su- support and love and patience. Um, and she was concerned about this. You know, she was concerned about this, but has trusted me to go through it. Mm-hmm. And and has not invalidated the results I've gotten, so I'm I'm grateful to her for that. But it, it was it was a it was a very large buy-in for her. Right, it feels like a big risk. It, it like... feels like a big risk. Um, you know, I have I have other people within that. I, I have people with uh, within the within the recovery community that are like, "Hey, are you sure? You know, is this a <laughs> yeah. isn't this a slip or something? You know." Right. And I, I've had to reconcile all that, but I, I, I never throughout my entire period of being in that community ever did not value what had happened to me within a, ther- with, within a, within a psychedelic context. Because right. those, those had been profound experiences that I'd always carried with me, you know, um, just like Roland Griffith says, like among the top five experiences of someone's lifetime. Um, and, and I'd had, I'd had a, uh, white light mountaintop experience, uh, that relieved me of the desire to drink ever. But previously in Japan, mm-hmm. when honestly I was in the depth of my act of drinking, uh, I'd had another extremely intense, um, <laughs> Satori experience during a tea ceremony post competition. Uh, the competition was exhausting, and there was a lot of, let's just say, political stuff going on between Japan and the U.S. about mm-hmm. who should win. Maybe <laughs> I, right. I, th- I think that's as much as I'll touch on that there. But so I had a, an extremely profound spiritual experience there that was completely unexpected. It was the same thing when I recovered, but this, this, this just, it it annihilated the depression and the resiliency Mm. has been, uh, incredible to me. It's been weird being inside the tele learning with my kids is uh, very frustrating. The the loss of income because of the, uh, the gym shutdown and everything that has been, um, also, you know, worrisome and my sympathies go out to everyone dealing with that. So I would just like to interject, stay at home, wear your mask, wash your hands. Uh, please, after everything New York went through, everybody as an American and a world citizen should not negate the loss of our fellow citizens that have died here. We all need to be masking up. We all need to be um, I mean, we're we're coming back to a shutdown, so please don't waste it. But I, I I think if I had not gone through, if I had not gone through the dosing session just before the lockdown, I have no idea what kind of person I would have been going through this. Mm-hmm. As someone that was pretty significantly depressed uh, prior to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It feels like a big, like scary risk, right? Like just imagine the folks who had like, yes, <laughs> the folks in your situation that just didn't get it. There's a lot of them. Yeah. There's so many people with major depressive disorder. And it's, it's, it's <sighs> I, I, just to try to convey to all those folks out there that are sitting either in hesitancy or in judgment of this approach. I, 
I just want to please ask them uh, to have as much compassion and willingness as possible that they can extend to those that have not found relief through the standard medical model. There's a lot of them. There's an awful lot of them because we know that there are many, many people out there that do find relief from SSRIs and similar type uh, psychoactive medications, but there are also many, many people that they just doesn't even begin to touch it. And the stigma... And they weren't and, designed to be used for decades. No. And... No. Yeah. No, they weren't. And, um, and, and that's what, what unfortunately happens. is like people are just trying to get through their day-to-day -day life so they can make a living, so they can get medical insurance, you know, things of that nature. But the stigma and the disinformation that surrounds this sphere is substantial. Mm -hmm. I think if it had not been for all the people that have been, as I said before, quietly beavering away on this, obviously MAPS gets a huge amount of recognition here for what they've done for people with PTSD. I've worked with multiple vets with PTSD. Mm. Interestingly enough, I know one who, who had a... This will probably be interesting to you because of all the breath work you've done. Uh, I had one. He didn't work with me, but he's a fellow trainer mm. who, who experienced significant resolution of his chronic PTSD through breath work. He did some mm. variations off of... Uh, I think Wim Hof and stuff. Right. And he claims he's completely cured and he was having something like 2000 panic attacks a year at a certain point. Oh. And he has a book for free on Amazon. Um, his name is Jordan Vizina. Um, I think it's something called like the five pillars of PTSD. I think he's made that mm. available for free now. And then he's combining mm. his breathwork approach as well as what he had learned um, inside of Z health. And yeah. I myself came from a very significant breathwork background from the Kiai Keto approach. They have what's called Masogi training, which is this crazy hours long shouting, chanting uh, thing, <laughs> mm. <laughs> which is supposed to be a cleansing ceremony. But now when I look back at it, it's like, that's hardcore breathing. And then they have a, a, a soft right. meditative approach to it as well for just expansive breath development. Mm. I'm a little off track here. Um, Oh, no worries. But but all of those things were were in place when I came into this. So uh, having explored all those modalities and then finally like, I give up, I'm going to give this a try. For people with depression out there, I, I don't think this can come soon enough. We have to get through these phase two trials, the phase three trials. That validation is crucial and important, but when I look at the broad scope of the mental health crisis we are facing now and will be facing post COVID, yeah, I mean it. It makes me bang my fist because the the suffering is going to be substantial. I mean, right now we have healthcare workers that are doing incredible, just ungodly hours in terrible conditions, watching all these people die and suffer. And those that escape, you know, there's, it's, it's not just going to be lung damage. It's not just going to be vascular damage. There are going to be people with neurological damage from this. This is an incredibly wily virus. And I would not be surprised to see some of those effects significantly ameliorated by something from the psychedelic sphere. Mm. If, if not just the emotional consequences, I, we, we all know of the work that they're starting to do uh, with people that have dementia, uh, some mm -hmm. of the exploration around what they're doing for Alzheimer's as well as other things. And we've seen what can be done in terms of cluster headaches stuff of that nature. Uh, there seems to be a significant anti-inflammatory quality <laughs> at play, as well as um, like just the fact that um, 
me personally, I feel as if there were genuine inhibitory pathways that had been suppressed by the depression for years and are now back online. And the hopefully the neuroplasticity that arose in allowing new frameworks and thought pathways to open up. Uh, and then how those interact with the receptor loop down below in my limbs and my body. I, I think that happened from one single 25 milligram dose. <laughs> Once. A, <That's> a <laughs> single yeah. dose. There is a child intruding and he's going away. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Yeah, how magical is that? It's like 25 milligrams of a powder yeah. has this extraordinary effect. System wide. One or two times. A system wide effect. I think system wide. I think yeah. it's system wide. Not exclusively in the in like no. ego. Not it's no, like which, a lot more broad. Yes. Yeah. Have you heard us say this line before? Mind is at the very least diffused throughout the body. Wait, say that again. Um, mind is at the very least diffused throughout the body. So there is interestingly enough, I was just reviewing this morning. There is a phrase from my key Aikido days that goes like this: Your mind is the body made subtle, the body is unrefined mind. And I, I don't disagree. I mean, if you look at what people were trying to do for a while with things like autism spectrum disorder and the brain-gut interactions that seem to be pretty strong there, you can see that in people with depression often have other inflammatory conditions. You look at the enteric nervous system, and the high volume of serotonin that's available down there. Some people with chronic back pain actually need a lot of visceral work because a lot of that pain is referred mm. because I'm going way out there again. Uh, or not, but those things, I, I think the gradation between mind and body is a lot less uh, stark than people imagine. <laughs> um, you right. look at what's happening in the chronic pain sphere and um, homuncular representations of missing limbs. And once again, that's where we see the nociceptive and mechanoceptive inputs that are denied those people getting modulated by visual stimuli. That's, there's a whole new ocean that's standing in front of us right now. Um, I'm actually... Um, <laughs> Uh, I've, I've, been, I've been interacting based on my personal experience on the couch. I've been reaching out to some researchers um, and discussing it with some people that are already in the uh, medical cannabis sphere up in Canada, trying mm. to see what might be possible to explore. Uh, I don't have anything concrete so far, but I've been put in touch with some not insignificant investors in the psychedelic world now and trying to decide what, if anything can be done because you look at the breadth and the depth of what's happening out there already. But I think there's some, I, based on some of the stuff that happened to me, not just with the depression, but down in my body um, and some of my neurological functions, I think there is a lot of room to broaden what can be done with this stuff. Like I, can't wait for more people to take that approach court. I, There's so much yeah, room. Yeah, there really is. And it's, it's, you, you can talk to, I think a not insubstantial degree about, you know, the cultural bias that, that has been kind of obstructing what indigenous cultures have found in that associative iterative approach over, I think millennia, you know, don't eat that plant, you know, eat it with that plant. It's like, huh. I remember my grandfather told me when he eats this plant, when someone has this type of distress or whatever, it seemed to sort that out. Um, and then that getting codified over the years through oral traditions. And, and now some people are, are going out there and saying it's possible that, you know, I think I just saw this the other day. Someone asked, uh, are psychedelics the antibiotics of psychiatry? And it's like, whoa, you know, that's, <laughs> that's, vast 
that is vast. Um, and it, it's hard not to contain my excitement over, over something like that. Cause, cause like I said, this was a Robin Caruso type experience. And, um, when I was doing this, um, previously I was starting to ramp up in my Aikido experience and then I was becoming this live and apprentice. And that was a pretty strict, almost monk like life. And as best I could, I was trying to be a good little Uchi Deshi, which was not easy. And I had to not do certain things that would interfere with that type of day-to-day uh, endeavor. And so psychedelics went on the back burner. And I was reading a lot of McKenna back then. And I actually got to meet Terrence at a uh, mm. lecture at the University of Washington once. and. I tried to describe to him afterwards what I was doing in Aikido. And I said, uh, the following thing I said to him was like, you know, I know he had said some pretty striking things about guruism. And I, I think there's a real chance of that being a danger as this Renaissance is reopening. We all have to kind of be on guard for char- spiritual oh, charlatanism. active danger already. Say it again. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a, an active danger already. It's a minefield. <laughs> I mean, there, there's yeah. people that are going to be claiming to be all sorts of shamans or whatever. And, and we've seen just the danger from uh, people being sexually abused in some of these retreat contexts. That's just distressing doesn't even begin to describe. I mean, disgusting, I think, is the only word, you know. But yeah. um, so I, I said to him, you know, it's like, I, I know you're kind of, I, I do this sort of key-based approach. I I know you don't think much of gurus and all that. Uh, And he goes, well, actually, I may think that gurus themselves are nothing but purveyors of charlatanism. But when it comes to the Taoist and using chi, I think that's the genuine McCoy. And it just floored me right there. To this day... (laughs) To this day, I I regret not then saying, hey, you don't happen to have any DMT on you, do you? But I just (laughs) couldn't. And I knew there's some weird thing about me where people that aren't cops think I'm a cop. And all cops absolutely don't think I'm a cop. So... (laughs) Interesting. It's a weird (laughs) little Mr. Rogers neighborhood to occupy in the sphere. Mm. But um, he said that and... It was affirming enough to reassure me that I didn't need to and to go back into that into that whole world without needing to have this in addition. Um, and and I had profound meditation and some out of sensory experiences in that context. My my framework now has been reinformed in many ways because of the the neurophysiological approach and using that, but then now once again, dipping back into this and hearing some of the ontological discussions you guys have, you know, I I can, I'm just thinking back to some of the stuff you said about Ralph Metzner recently. Um, Mm. And from a safety standpoint, I think most people should exhaust the, the science framework first, but from an experiential personal spiritual standpoint, I don't think it's wrong to to embrace some of the spiritual models out there because of the immediate impact they make within somebody's psyche, sense of well-being, sense of agency in the world, if that mm-hmm. if that helps, the reassurance that it can bring. I mean, obviously I mentioned my my little Shinto incantation thing that I did before the ceremony, but I mean what does that have to do with (laughs) the chemical being ingested and then having an effect on my prefrontal cortex? Right. But I believe it did. I believe it somehow made it possible that I did receive the medication as I'm 99.99% certain I did, though I have no results back because the study has been over. But like I said, I don't think I was randomized. It was the placebo was Benadryl, right? Diphenhydramine. I know. I uh, I think it was niacin. 
niacin. Okay. Which is supposed to have a, 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 a kind of a little bit of a buzzing effect, body high, or, or, or at least a, oh, it's super uncomfortable. So, so, okay. So <laughs> then right there, I was, I was not uncomfortable in, in any sense of the word. It was the exact opposite. Mm. So I've, uh, I've talked to some of the researchers and it's really interesting that they, they even present this at horizons once in a while mm. where the plus they actually really don't know. Like they've no. unblinded and been shocked. Like, wait a second, I'm, that was niacin or that was Benadryl. So That's crazy. I've been waiting for that, wondering, you know, because mm. like, honest to God, I, uh, <laughs> yeah, so all my recovery friends are laughing at me right now, will be laughing at me if if that's what <laughs> happens, because mm -hmm. you could not tell me I didn't receive the the target substance today. The, the, I, mm -hmm. I, I would fully deny that. And if you told me that I had in fact received the placebo, I would say that you had an error. Now, mm -hmm. there is somehow they had made an error. Now, that is on top of the fact that I am through the work I've done with chronic pain patients and all the work that's coming out of like the, the Noi group down in Australia and New Zealand, all the work that Ramachandran uh, has done with mirror box therapy and things like that. And what we and I have personally seen as a direct result in pain resolution due to the placebo effect. Even knowing that, there's no way anyone can tell me I didn't receive the target substance, the study substance. Right. There's just no way. But if right. if that did happen, that, that's a new kind of wonder in and of itself. <laughs> right. You no, know, but I, I don't. Since since I'm not psychedelically naive, I, I I no way. So our not to discount it, but the way we we would think about it is it's all in you, <laughs> right? Like the same way you can have a non drug satori experience, yes, it's yes, still you and your yes. body and, and your so, mind. And, yeah, I'm like, yeah, I'm the big. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite the Petri dish, <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't make it any less magical, right? No. It's like, uh, if, if anything, whoa. it would make it, <laughs> I, but here's the point I would really want people to understand. Mm -hmm. Sure. It doesn't make it any less magical if it wasn't, but it doesn't make it any less magical than if it was right. E either way. I'm, it's like, I had that experience undeniable with full on visual effects. I, I mean, extremely deep, complex, you know, I had full body tremors, not full body. There, there was a, I don't, I don't want to get into it too deeply because like I'm, I actually am trying to explore what the possibilities of starting something up with this is, but uh, like I've, mm -hmm. I've seen resolution of other things as a result of, of this. <sighs> There's a story Stan Groff shared recently about um, some crippling back pain he had. And he did, I don't know like why he went this way, but he did a very high dose edible cannabis session. Okay. So like, I don't, I don't know what milligrams or anything, but it seemed to self-resolve his um, back pain with a single high dose cannabis session. And like that to me just indicates there's so many like yes. weird things that science doesn't really have its hands around yet. And that seems to be a lot of what you're talking about here. With but pain it and... is getting its hands around it. So what has happened over the last Good. 15 years, just in now, I, I know Robin Carhart Harris, and even something that you brought up previously about brain imaging studies, um, like one of those researchers saying, wait, we have to go back and look at all this because there's a, there's a flaw in our observations and our modeling. And so right. we need to throw all of that I forget out. forget that study, but that was a big deal. Yeah, where it was like, it's worthless, you know? <laughs> but at the same time, it's not. Because it's made people really take this stuff seriously and see that something is there. Something is changing. Like just in terms of chronic pain, the, the model is is so different than it was 15 years ago. It used to be like, this is a signal from damaged tissue, right? And now we know for sure that pain is not just a signal from damaged tissue, that what pain is, is a neuropsychosocial emotional event. And more than anything, it's likely an action signal that something needs to change. And, change. and in, in regards to Anislav Groff having the back pain. I mentioned nociception and mechanoception earlier. 
So in most joint beds around the body, there is a ratio of mechanoceptors to nociceptors with mechanoceptors being in a far higher prevalence, mm. except for the low back and the eyeball, where mm. that's very reversed. Think how sensitive your eye is to, to touch or pain. The low back, they used to think it's like, oh, you know, someone has spondylosis or they have... Um, a disc rupture or, you know, um, uh, there's a misalignment there or there's a, a compression on the nerves. That's what's causing the pain, right? That was that mechanical Cartesian approach. But they've done multiple meta studies of MRIs of people with back pain. And the thing that emerged was that, um, you know, they, they looked at all these back pain sufferers, they looked at their films and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, look right right here, that, that vertebrae is broken. Uh, over here we have a disc rupture. Oh, they're, you know, look how porous uh, that vertebrae is there. But then they found people with pristine films, nothing pathological in that film, and they're debilitated. And so mm. then they did a reverse study of people with no pain no pain at all. Yeah. And they found people that were like essentially the walking dead when it came to their spine health. <laughs> and they're like, I feel great. So, and, and th there, there are systems out there for resolving back pain. This is a huge sphere. There are systems out there resolving back pain that insist it's all emotional. There was like a study that Boeing did of its engineers that had back pain. They're like, gosh, we have, we lose so many work hours. How much, how much time loss, you know, how much more is our insurance to this? We should, we're engineers. We should be able to nail this down. We're awesome. We build planes, you know, we built the 747. And so they did a system-wide study there to find out, okay, what are, what are all the causes and correlations to back pain? And they could, after the whole thing, they could only find one single feature that nearly everybody with significant back pain had. They all hated their jobs. And, and then that, that was it. But, but that's a big stressor. If you consider pain yeah. to be a spillover point into nociception for the body, you know, it's a warning action signal. And if, some, if there's a continual survival threat happening in your life, you know, it used to be the fight or flight stuff, but now it could be job loss, job insecurity, job stress. You know, that's our hunting and gathering now. And if that's getting triggered, and at some point it reaches a spillover point, you know, that's going to spill over into the back because it's so good at feeling pain. If your nervous system is trying to get you to change something, rather than come up with a new pain, let's just make his back hurt. That'll stop him. You know, that'll make him pay attention. And I, I think this was told to me by... Um, the founder of um, Z Health, like he's he's postulated a couple times before, Dr. Cobb. He's he thinks that depression and other similar things are more likely nociceptive events uh, than we realize. That it's the nervous system's way of like, hey, something is something is going on here, and you need to change it. Uh, so there there mm -hmm. there is the actual organic structural quality to it but it also may be the nervous system's a, attempt to get your attention to to change something to restructure something and not in a necessarily woo woo way um I, which i'm i'm not trying to degrade that sphere i'm really not but but often when we um when we look at people there's this whole somatosensory approach to to dealing with chronic pain and others, similar conditions, emotional issues where you go in, you get bodywork therapy and stuff like that, and they talk about the the stress or the trauma or the emotions being trapped in the tissue, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, like, you'll have people that are, like digging their elbow deep in there, and they're they're making you wail and cry and stuff like that. And it's when you can re-engage that emotional trauma that the 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 physical issue is resolved. I've heard him postulate that it's, it's a little bit different, that often when people have an emotional trauma, uh, often what's unaddressed is that there was an original coincident injury that happened at the same time. Physical injury 
And that never got addressed. And if you can resolve that ongoing hot event in the nervous system around that injury site and kind of allow the nervous system to see, hey, that tissue healed a long time ago. Everything's fine here now. You can downgrade this inflammation that breaks up that pre existing neural chunk between the emotional event of the trauma as well as the tissue event of it. And as soon as that breaks up, the emotional trauma is released um, because it, it, it can't be, it's state dependent. It can't be accessed any, anymore. So I, I, of course, my mind went just absolutely bananas after, <laughs> after my dosing session in NYU trying to, trying to figure out all the applications within, within the framework I know uh, to the event that happened on the couch there. So, ooh. Um, this rhymes a lot, Court, with um, Groff's idea of a condensed experience or coex system. Huh. This is like a really similar concept um, that you're kind of laying out there. So you might check that literature out. No, well, I've heard you. I've heard you talking about it, um, and so of course it's it's on the reading list. And a lot of things within the psychedelic sphere have pushed their way towards the head of the reading list. And like I've oh, yeah. I've been trying to engage researchers online. Like I had a little chat with. Uh, Dr. Fadiman, uh, which was pretty mm, interesting. Good. Like I said, reaching out to um, researchers and investors in in Canada that I knew as a result of my association with Kirk McLeod, who's the security head there, uh, head security advisor at the UN. And uh, I, I think everything that's there is already in place, but it's going to take people um, that have a pretty broad depth and breadth of experience in dealing with this type, these type of issues to make the application of any type of psychedelic approach useful. Because I think they are going to leave a significant number of tools and regressions on the table. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm deeply excited. (laughs) I I, I honestly thought, honestly, I thought the, 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 greatest benefit going in was going to be the relief of the depression. And as I said, we're, we're standing before a whole, as you clearly understand, it's, it's a whole new ocean. And I, I'd love to read um, what Dr. Groff has uh, available as well. Cause I've, I've talked, I, I know you've talked before about some of the, um, how do you call them preconditions <laughs> uh, sure. that, that set up for people very early in life. And then if you're, you know, when you're, you're, when you're talking about some of the spheres Ralph Metzger brought up, I, I think there's a lot of science left to, to study there as well, because I, I don't think biologically most of us are capable of dealing with the time frame that's involved in evolution or <laughs> with the distance frame involved in like, say, the physical universe. But like, I, I think mm-hmm. there's like probably some very deeply buried instinctive neurological reactions to um, community and predators that maybe started when we were amoebas or at least fish stepping onto the shore and like hundreds of millions of years is not a short time frame. And um, so stuff that may come up, I think within a a a psychedelic context, I, I, I know a lot of people are, I think it was Strauss that you guys have mentioned that, you know, was dealing with all of the the, the so called entity experiences, and <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, um, Rick, you know, Rich Strassman. Rick Strassman, Strassman, thank you. And and it's like, you know, even mentioned Mac with the um, um, yeah. the the UFO stuff, and it's like I've I've met those people, I've actually met those mm-hmm. people like a, a couple ab- abductees. You know, um, I I can't imagine mm-hmm. what they're going through now with the emergence of this Navy footage of unidentified flying objects that were on the on the cockpit cameras that that's come out in the last oh, yeah. couple of years that's got to be anyways so but what is that i mean cuz they're they're real experiences that people are having i mean i just say pre-exhaust all scientific explanations first so i would go towards it's some type of default 
program for dealing with like a, a predator. Like, you know, the, the silly analogy is always like saber tooth tigers, but like, you know, if your ancestors had to survive an awful lot of saber tooth tigers or whatever way before that, there's, there's probably something in there that has a representation of that. So if, if you think of what the Tibetans represent with all the gnashing teeth and everything and the whole bardo thordal or whatever it's called Mm -hmm. and you know these things you'll see i just wonder if there's some type of machine language level response in us uh that we don't get to see in our waking consciousness that might emerge more fully under under the influence does that make sense or am i just wildly wildly (laughs) i I think you're totally like, yeah, we've got to be really rigorously scientific, yes. but we've also got to be open to yes. like when we exhaust yes. scientific possibilities or easily explained things in, inside of our knowledge set, we've got to expand. This is this uh, idea of the new paradigm, like um, psychology as it stands today is is okay, yeah. but it's it's very incomplete. It doesn't account for religious experience or transpersonal phenomenon no. very well. Um, thus, transpersonal psychology you know, which includes and transcends kind of like in the Ken Wilbur framework. Like we don't want to throw it out. We want to include it all. I, I, we, don't, we want to be rigorous, yeah. but we're not being rigorous when we just toss out data. That's, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't disagree there. I, 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 just to be devil's advocate there, because I, I, I can imagine some of the researchers that are a little bit more deeply in the science camp are just like yanking their hair <laughs> when they hear that sometimes because they're, I've been online now for about four months going back into what's happening nowadays. There are clearly opportunists. There are clearly charlatans that are it's, it's Absolutely. Just like not just, not just are like unethical, you know, and seeing that occur. It's, um, it's, it's the people I could call out court. I, it's I, unbelievable I, what I could say. I'm sure <laughs> I, I am. I am absolutely yeah. sure. And so, we we really need to work strongly in tandem with the research community be, because what they're providing now is a window to relief for so many of us so yes. many of us and and i would hope that the research community validates the people that have established the beachhead you know cuz really that's what this is you know if you consider what ehrlichman did to a generation of mental health sufferers, it's unconscionable. You know, um, the gaslighting that, that, that's happened, you know, it's, it's been impactful, I think, in no small way. Uh, but at the same time, I, I, I fear a Wild West. <laughs> you know, uh, there's... If, if you oh, consider... Already, it already exists. Yeah, I, I know, <laughs> I know. Well, just look what's happening in terms yeah. of... I, I don't want to go into this too deeply, but just disinformation campaigns and what's being yes. achieved with social media alone to skew reality. And if you think of those people hijacking this, it you know we're going to have to be vigilant. I think, yeah. but that's. <laughs> It's one of the catchphrases I got from Harry Potter. I think it came from elsewhere, but like the price is eternal vigilance and we need to keep vigilant always. That's and right. It's well, tough. It wasn't it's eternal tough. vigilance. It doesn't always win your friends. Say what? It doesn't always win your friends. No, no, so. it doesn't. It, it, and, and I think I'm okay with that. Honestly. Um, because That's the price and it's okay. We should be choosy. I was it who was it that said the 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 price of freedom is eternal vigilance? Was that it was either it's Hamilton or Jefferson? I got it from Harry Potter, dudes? but it was something more like Heming, not Hemingway, but uh, Churchill, maybe. Uh, I, I think bef- I think even before that, it was either. Um, see, now I feel like an idiot because there's people that <laughs> do their their three R's better than me. Um, who would know? Oh no, that's that's Hamilton in the. Um, <laughs> Uh, in the Congress papers, he's the one who said, I, I have no idea. And that was probably based on Rousseau or something. God knows. So, you know. uh, well, I just found an article here saying it was used about 700 times in close proximity in various newspapers during the first half of the 19th century. So, wow. Yeah. So who knows? Yeah. Is the good answer. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. 
Anyway, Court, we should probably wrap. We're a little over an hour and a half. Okay. But I, I think this is a really lovely conversation. I really appreciate you going out on a limb, using your real name here, and sharing your story. It's it's crucial that we do, you know, because um, a, a false picture has been painted of what's of what's possible here, and and when it's only seen in a recreational context where they use some slightly marginalized, perverse catchphrase like hippies or dirty hippies or something like that. And um, use that as a way to blame and shame people for seeking relief. And even worse, to to claim that the results they're bringing back are invalid. I think that's a crime. I honestly do. And so if if uh, if I can if I can bring any of my previous experience and um, reputation to weigh on the scale of the good that can be caused from this, I'm I'm happy to do it because suffering under unresolved and seemingly intractable depression and anxiety is is really no joke. When they talk about the cost of this worldwide, billions of people suffering from this and suicide is is not a joke people that don't want to work or interact with their friends or go out or have fun and even worse think it's just not in the cards for them uh and and have and have exhausted all the approaches that are available to them within our current medical system and still are not finding relief it's not ethical to deny this opportunity to them. It's not ethical. It's, I, I, would, I would say it's immoral. Yes, 100% agreed. Court Wing, thank you for joining us. And let's, let's maybe do this again. I would, I would love to circle back with you in a few months to see where you've gone. Uh, absolutely. You know, um, I just thank you guys for the, the work you're doing, the way you put yourself out there, for your dedication and thoroughness. You know, at first I was like, oh, psychedelics today. Okay, haha, cool and everything. But then as I'm going back through your archive, it's, <laughs> it is substantial and it's persistent. Thank so you. So thank you guys. And um, um, please keep fighting the good fight All right. and, and making, Glad good, to have you making on our side. good trouble. I'm glad to have you guys on ours. <laughs> so thank you so much. I just wanted to add my profound thanks to the Usona Institute and NYU's Department of Psychiatry for sponsoring this investigational study into psilocybin for major depression disorder. If it weren't for them, I wouldn't be in full remission now. And I wanted to recognize their efforts and remind everybody that they're a nonprofit corporation that does accept donations. So please visit them online. Thank you. And there you have it, Court Wing on Psychedelics Today. I hope you all enjoyed the show. If you want to give us some feedback or some love, hit us up on email at psychedelics today, email at gmail.com. If you want to leave us a review, feel free to do so. That'd be very helpful either at Facebook or on your podcast app. That'd be great. Or just tell a friend. It's easy enough. And um, I think that's it for now. Joe Moore signing off for Psychedelics Today. Bye-bye.